time for some people. Oh, yeah. Well, do you all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Let's see, is this? Yes. 18 minutes. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So, is, I'm on, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'm a pollster. Uh, which means I, can, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. As Anita said, I really appreciate being able to come to your beautiful city. Hopefully I'll be able to see some of it. Uh, I think I will, but I do really appreciate it. A, I love the topic and, and, and I love the city. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk about the same topic from a, uh, another perspective, which is I'm a pollster, which means I conduct public opinion surveys and focus groups. I do it all over the world. And the goal of what I do is to provide communications advice. So ultimately, the reason why I conduct research is to provide advice on what to say, who to say it to. So for that reason, I am always thinking about effective communications as the thing that I ultimately really need to get right when I'm doing campaign work or when I'm trying to understand a campaign. And I went to graduate school to a communications program at something called the Annenberg School. Um, and I've tried to keep up with the literature on communications theory since I did that. And every year I actually go back and I do a, a talk for undergraduate students at the program and show how communications theory can be applied to campaigns in a practical way. Because often communications theory and the application or the uh, campaign communications don't really meet. I personally find communications theory very useful. So what I like to do is to talk not about case studies, but to talk to use communications theory to help understand the question that Anita raised, which is how is it possible that Donald Trump is a viable candidate for the presidency of the United States, which is a perplexing question and disturbing in a lot of ways. Um, so first of all, when applying communications theory, uh, there's the first question is, how is it even possible that people support this person despite uh, some of the uh, attitudes that he has, which seem like they should be anathema to most of the American public? Second question I'd like to get at is, how voters' mindset affects the kinds of messages that you need to use when you're communicating with them? Because often we will talk about campaign message as if one message always uh, applies to all voters. But in fact, the mindset of the voters needs to be taken into consideration. And the Trump case is a really acute example of it because uh, he's trying to create, intentionally I believe, he is trying to create a mindset that affects the way people think about campaigns. And when I say think about, what I really mean is how they process information. So I'll talk about that in some more detail. Um, what do candidates need to tell voters about themselves and their opponents? I'll just go through some examples, drawing on communications theory. Uh, and then also the final point is, there's a funny little nuance here, which is we're dealing with serious economic challenges in the United States. And the nature of the challenge varies depending on who you're speaking with. Uh, either it's the challenge of income inequality, or it's the challenge of prices, or it's the challenge of the availability of good jobs. But regardless, there are clearly economic and security challenges in the United States. And yet, at the conventions, I will predict you're going to hear both candidates talk about their children. So I'd like to talk a little bit about why they would do that. So first of all, um, the, the first question, why would you support Donald Trump in the first place? It's easy, I believe, as Anita noted, and a lot of people uh, do dismiss Donald Trump and dismiss the idea that people might find what he has to say appealing. But in fact, he's tapping into something that is a real concern to voters, and I believe he's offering them some hope for addressing a set of real concerns in a way that none of the other candidates uh, have been doing. So uh, one impact of it is, if you first of all, if you think about communications, there, there are multiple levels of it, which I'll get into in more detail, but you have more emotional ways to communicate with voters and you have more cerebral, thoughtful ways to communicate with voters. So it's useful to know people's emotional state which is a difficult thing to measure. Um, and in fact, the tools for measuring it uh, are not well developed. The questions are not well developed. And there are other tools for measuring emotional states which are also not well developed. Nevertheless, despite all the limitations, it's very useful to understand people's emotional states. So this is two different polls, both polls that I did, two different universes, 
One of them is general election voters in what we call the battleground states. Like Anita noted, national polls are really not very useful in the US because of the Electoral College. And I'll just add one point to what Anita said, which is I know on the Democratic side, that we don't even do national polls in our campaigns. We'll only do battleground polls. So the press is using a tool that the campaigns don't find useful. So the one on the left is from a national general election battleground poll that I did. And the one on the right is from a larger sample but narrower universe. That one is this WWCV is white working class voters. So that study was looking specifically at white voters who don't have a college education. And like Anita mentioned, in the Democratic primary, you had a very clear age difference in support between Clinton and Sanders. And I'd add one more dimension, which is that if you were a young male under age about 40, there's no, almost no chance you were voting for Hillary Clinton. If you were a woman ab age 60 or above, there was almost no chance you were voting for Sanders in the primary. So there was this pronounced age and gender dynamic. And the funny thing is, they spent a lot of money and a lot of effort, but in the end, demographics really determine the outcome of most of the primary. Um, in the general election, there's a similar dynamic because of the way Donald Trump has waged his campaign. It shouldn't be this way necessarily. But if you are not white, you are overwhelmingly voting for Hillary Clinton. If you are white and you have a college education, very competitive. Hillary Clinton has the potential to do better than past Democratic candidates. But where Donald Trump's real strength is, is in non-college educated white voters. And there are reasons for that related to his message, which I'll get into. But this question was just asking about mental state. And there's been a characterization of the electorate as very angry. Barbarians at the gates looking for uh, taking on rich people and overturning the banks and so forth. There is some of that, but their main overwhelming uh, emotional state, and again, this is looking at two different studies, is concern. Not anger, it's concern. Why would they be concerned? So this is one little snapshot looking at the white working class voters, at why people might be concerned. There's a lot more data than this, which I won't get into, but basically there are multiple levels of concerns. There are concerns about how globalization is affecting the American economy. This is a big one that Donald Trump taps into because he is reminding people that the good jobs are leaving the United States and getting replaced with jobs that people do not consider as good. There are also demographic changes happening in the United States. And if you look at this one, it's asking you about some of those demographic changes, such as the increase of mosques in the United States. And the white working class voters are very concerned about the demographic changes. And then another one that we don't really depict here is just changes about the disruptions that happen because of technology. So there are other things happening, but there are a lot of changes is the, really the bottom line here. And the changes result in a lot of anxiety because for all of President Obama's strengths, the one thing he has never really been able to do is to convince people that the future definitely looks brighter because he has a specific road map that gets us to a brighter future. So there's been a lot of underlying anxiety because of that. And I'm not casting aspersions because I think the president is terrific, but he even brought in Bill Clinton at the convention last time in order to make that kind of argument because he saw that that was probably not the, his natural strength. So the result is there's a lot of anxiety about the future. Donald Trump taps into it. This is one example of how that works. This is, again, from the white working class study. So in the US, in the Democratic primaries, we've had a lot of a big debate about college education and should college be free or should college be affordable. But if you ask working class voters how they think about the future and you ask them what do they consider to be a good job, they overwhelmingly say a good job is a factory job, not an office job. So in the primaries, they just spent a lot of time answering the wrong question for at least this group of general election voters. They listen to this debate about college and they say, that's irrelevant. We, I know college is expensive, sure, I get that, but I'm not sure it's that valuable in the first place. And when you talk to voters about their children in college, they will say, I, I absolutely see the connection between education and opportunity, but my kids are gonna have to pay for their own college because I just can't do it for them. So it's great if college is less expensive, but what they really want is job training. Occupational training, job training, more like the German model, although most Americans wouldn't say it that way. But they're concerned about being able to get this kind of job. So any, this is a subset of the population, but these are the ones that Donald Trump is talking to. So when he says, we're losing our manufacturing jobs, those jobs are moving overseas, China is taking our jobs, this is exactly what he's talking about. And he's making a point that really responds to deeply held concerns among many Americans. 
So communications theory, mindset. So what, how, what's the relevance here? So if people are in a heightened emotional state, such as concern, and that is especially going to be true with the non-college white voters, that can have an effect on the way they process information. Because people who are in a heightened emotional state are processing information in a different way than people who are calm and cool and collected and not in a heightened emotional state. Um, if you're in a heightened emotional state, it means that something, it, there are various terms for it, but one, which is the most popular one now, I believe, is system one processing. The basic division, um, there's a great book called Thinking Fast and Slow that synthesizes a lot of this information, but they use terms called system one and system two, which I'll get into in more detail. But system one is basically not deep thinking about information. And that's usually people's first stop in decision making. But if they're in a heightened emotional state, it also might be their last stop in their decision making. So if you have a message that contains some, a lot of detailed specific information and you're trying to reach someone, that might be a terrific message if you can get people to be calm and focus on it. But if they're in a heightened emotional state, that message is not going to be responsive. It's not going to be effective when you're talking to those voters. So that my message as far as that goes is that when you're thinking about the effectiveness of a message you also have to think about the mindset of the recipient of the message so um yeah i'll skip this last point so this is looking at system one versus system two thinking and and what the implications are as far as the uh the campaigns go so system one thinking uh means that you're talking in emotional terms gut level terms, usually it's a very fast reaction to things. Usually it's, as I said, it drives your rational decision making. So you have an emotional conclusion and then you come up with a rational construct afterwards. So the thing I skipped over on the other one was um, there are great examples of people making up excuses for Donald Trump. So he did a uh, speech at the mall in Washington recently. It was a rally for veterans. So as Anita mentioned, he disparaged people who were captured, prisoners of war. This was a rally that was highlighting prisoners of war. And the Washington Post did an article about it. First of all, it was interesting because the first headline was Donald Trump, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not gonna remember it exactly, but it was basically Donald Trump impresses audience at the mall. But if you read the article, it didn't say that at all. It actually said attendance was kind of low and Donald Trump complained about the attendance. So it's kind of a neatest point about the press having this conclusion. What happened later was they quietly changed the headline. So if you look at it now, the headline is actually different and they made it more neutral. But in the article, they quoted someone who was talking about how they support Donald Trump and they were asked, well, what about his position on POWs? And they said, oh, I think he's sorry for having said that. Well, he never apologized for having said that. That was people making a rationalization to be consistent with an emotional conclusion they had already come to. So that's system one driving system two, which is exactly how Donald Trump is so successful. And it happens in, normally in day-to-day -day life in campaigns, but especially in this one. System two, it's thoughtful, you're weighing arguments, you're talking about specific points, your decision-making is slower, you're weighing things. Plans and platforms are a lot more important when you're talking system two. And we've seen in this election year, Hillary Clinton, for instance, has given a lot of substantive speeches and a lot of detailed plans, but it never has an impact. And in fact, right now, if you look at speculation about the vice presidential pick, you'll see that the way the press is weighing it is, will the candidate be exciting or not? Well, how is that a rational way <laughs> to pick <laughs> the person who will be vice president and next in line for the presidency? And yet that is a main criteria. Will the person be exciting? Will they deliver an exciting convention? And if you look at it qualitatively and you look at historically the way these conventions work, even the most boring picks in the past have actually resulted in a nice positive bounce for the campaigns. And yet they still go back to the same criteria. Anyway, not rational. So if you look at Donald Trump and his language, it's designed for system one thinking. So on security, he says things like, if we don't get tough and if we don't get uh, smart and fast, we're not going to have our country anymore. There will be nothing, absolutely nothing. And the thing is, you know, I had to keep on updating this as this conference got closer because he kept on generating new things. Um, so these aren't even, you know, the latest. Uh, bad things will happen. It will be bad. That is as system one as you can possibly get, right? There's no thought there. It's entirely gut. Just saying 
scary things are going to happen. Jobs, I will be the greatest jobs president that jo God ever created. No lack of confidence. The American dream is dead. I'll bring it back bigger and better and stronger, right? And he never gets to that next level, which is how will you do that? And the reason why I wanted to do this talk is partially to try and help understand how is it possible you can get away with that? And you can get away with it if you keep people in this worried, anxious mindset. For him, you could add anger to it as well. As long as people are in a heightened emotional state, he wins. So when people say, if his convention is chaos, it will actually be good for him, I think that's probably true. And they probably know that. They seem to know that because they're running a campaign that's based on a lot of political theories they picked up in the 60s. Um, and so I think that is their theory, which is if he can be the strong person in a moment of calm, then he can get away without having to ever get to this more system two position. So this is a really short video that then contrasts um, Secretary Clinton's approach. Random clip. The late, great Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. <laughs> Donald Trump has shown us who he is, and we sure should believe him. And it's not just on reproductive rights. Donald Trump would take us in the wrong direction on so many issues we care about economic justice, workers' rights, civil rights, human rights, the environment, all of that is on the line in this election. When Donald Trump says a distinguished judge born in Indiana can't do his job because of his Mexican heritage, or mocks a reporter with disabilities, or denigrates Muslims and immigrants, it goes against everything we stand for. He does not see all Americans as Americans. So this election isn't about the same old fights between Democrats and Republicans. They'll be there, don't worry. <laughs> but this election is profoundly different. It is about who we are as a nation. All right, so you get the idea, right? It starts off by quoting a poet. Uh, it's a very sound argument, legitimate argument, but it's a completely different communications approach. So if the electorate remains, or persuadable voters is really ultimately what you'd be talking about is persuadable voters in battleground states. If they get in an agitated mindset because we're having security issues or because there's bad economic news or just because of the nature of the debate, now we have the issue of these police shootings that seem to be amplifying. Uh, as long as that kind of thing continues, the potential for system one to be effective more than system two is a real threat if you're looking at it from the Clinton campaign perspective. So prospect theory. So that's system one versus system two. That's, that's, about, uh, that's one way of looking at things, which is type of processing. Another communications issue is something called prospect theory. I find this one really useful when you're trying to figure out if campaigns are on track or not. Prospect theory just says, and it's not a political theory, it's a, it, but it is uh, applicable, I think, to political campaigns. The basic issue is saying people weigh, when they're making a decision, what will I gain and what am I risking? So if you're listening to a campaign, it's always for me really useful to think, or when I'm trying to craft a message, so what are we saying that you're going to gain and what are we saying you're going to lose? So if you think about examples of how this works, the Obama campaign in 08 was a really great example of one where they decided that they were going to run uh, telling you that you have a lot to gain from the change represented by Barack Obama. But one of the things that prospect theory says is that usually people are motivated to avoid losses more than they are motivated to gain something. So Obama was a unique example because we had a collapsing economy. So for him, he could say, you're going to have something better in part because the backdrop was that if nothing changed, it was going to get worse. So the alternative to Obama was things were going to get worse. But it varies from campaigns to campaigns. So for instance, uh, Ronald Reagan ran a famous ad about how there's a bear in the woods. That was about how there's the threat of the Soviets at the time. That's talking about the risk. If you vote for Mondale, the Soviets are going to kill us. George Bush did a version of that with John Kerry. In this case, they did wolves instead of a bear. There are wolves out there. The wolves are going to get you. It's the same thing. They're trying to say there's a risk to voting for John Kerry because the wolves are going to get us. The Daisy ad, which I won't even bother to explain because I think you've probably all seen it, ultimate example of showing that there is a risk associated with voting for the alternative person. 
just went through a Columbia campaign recently. We're there. It was a great example of prospect theory because the president was showing that the potential gains of reelecting him were a peace agreement with the FARC, ending a 50-year war. That wasn't enough for people. The prospect of a gain of a peace agreement was not enough. We ultimately had to change the message to show, and if you vote for the other people, you're going to have ongoing war and economic inequality. So we had to add a risk. Now, when we did that in the campaign, I was intentionally thinking of prospect theory. So I find it really useful uh, in campaigns to just think about that. So when you're thinking about um, what's going on in this campaign, it's useful to look at what they're talking about in order to weigh how prospect theory applies to what they're doing. So in the case of Trump, he's identifying the risk, the status quo, right? If nothing changes, the economy, he said it will be bad, <laughs> will be dead, the economy will collapse, Right? The risk of the status quo of not changing and not voting for him is significant. He explains the risk. There'll be nothing left. And he, but he also offers an alternative. I'm going to be the best job creator God's ever seen, which is pretty good. That would be a lot of jobs. And so he offers hope. And that's the thing that is underappreciated, I believe, in some circles about Donald Trump, which is he has a positive message, too. I'm going to get good jobs. So on the Clinton side... And this has actually changed a lot. But she basically says changing to Donald Trump is risky. And the nature of the risk, though, change, right? The most recent version is that he's unfit for office. Before that, the video I showed you was more about how he's divisive. He'll divide America. Um, and her alternative, hope for unity and reducing barriers that hold people back. So now, if you think about this in terms of prospect theory, Who's giving you a scarier scenario? Is it Trump saying you're going to die and you're going to lose your job? Or is it Hillary Clinton saying he's not, he doesn't have sufficient experience and he's unfit and he's going to divide us? I personally think what he's saying is kind of scarier. Now, whether it's persuasive is a different story. But I think if you look at it in terms of prospect theory, he's offering a better negative. On the positive, who's offering a better positive? Unity and reducing barriers to success versus I'm going to bring back the American dream and good jobs. I think he's got an argument there, too. So that's why I think it's useful apply, to apply prospect theory to think about whether or not he has any shot. Of course, I'm, I'm not taking into account the fact that he's a racist and sweaty and orange-faced and <laughs> that he's alienating people in a lot of states. I mean, there are demographic issues and other things. But just in terms of pure communications, uh, he actually has an argument. Hindsight bias briefly, is a really interesting one that I've just started using in campaigns recently. I started to use it in a campaign actually in 2014 where we had to figure out how to deal with um, a tax that my candidate was getting for how she reformed a pension plan. And then I'd come across the information on hindsight bias and it seemed like a really handy tool and we used it and it worked really well. Uh, so hindsight bias just says if the outcome is good, then the process that led to the outcome must have been good. So why, in a communication setting, why is that useful? Because if you're getting attacked, you could argue about the details of what happened. So say I'm Benghazi, you could argue about the details of what happened, or you can just talk about in the end what happened. So the Republicans would say people died, Hillary Clinton, um, I think just basically in that case, which, and I don't think that's a big negative for her, but I think in the end she basically just says we did the best we could uh, given, given the circumstances. So that one, there's no, there's no political great way to come out of that. But that's where the Republicans use hindsight bias. But the, I think the, the application we see now is that the Trump campaign is probably going to use his family in order to say he must be a decent person because he raised decent kids because the kids haven't had a lot of scrutiny. As far as we know, the kids look like they're decent kids. So they've started to do that a little bit, and they've telegraphed that at the convention, you're going to hear more from the kids. The same thing, the first time I saw this happen, without thinking about it as hindsight bias, was in 2000. I was doing work for Hillary Clinton's campaign for Senate, the first campaign. And we saw that one of the most compelling things about Hillary Clinton to voters was that she's been a lifelong advocate for women and children, and people thought that they knew that it was true of her because she'd been doing it for so long, but also they said, I know she's a good parent because Chelsea's a good kid, so therefore the rest of it must be true. So that's been a phenomena that's been an active ingredient of Hillary Clinton's appeal from at least the 2000 campaign. 
which is she must have been a good mom because she has a good kid. So what's going to happen right now is there's going to be this argument where they involve the kids. Now, in the case of Trump, there's also a more complicated issue of how do you use hindsight bias when it comes to Trump's business? Because Trump says, I became a billionaire, so I must be a good businessman. Right? That's hindsight bias. The rest of this, these details, my lawsuits, whatever, who cares? I'm a billionaire. And I've employed thousands of people. So I'm, as he says, or what he says is, some people say I'm a world-class businessman. And I guess that's true. As if like anyone else says it other than him. But he says it all the time. And so the Clinton campaign is going to have to deal with that one. Because for them, what they want to use is hindsight bias to say, he's been a pr businessman who's hurt everybody who have dealt, who's dealt with him along the way. So they want to use it a different way. Don't look at his billions. Look at the wreckage that he caused in other people's lives. But it's two different ways of using hindsight bias to define his career kind of going backwards. So if you look at this little short clip, this is Fox News. And your daughters. I think that that's telling. It's very telling. And I'll tell you, if you talk to any woman in a, in a high profile position, you don't have to talk long before she says she has a strong dad. So fathers are extremely important in daughters' lives. And this is a point in our history, Brian, when we really need to get about the business of championing dads, particularly dads and daughters. It's dads are very devoted to their daughters. And you know as well as I that the answer to so many of our social ills is getting our dads back. And, and doctor, also, don't you think it's important not just to say be nice and be oh. caring, but show them you trust them, exactly. give them the same power and Confidence. prestige as maybe your son. You know, a, a father has an authority with a capital A in his, in his daughter's eyes. He you get the idea. So they're doing, it was part of a longer push that they were doing to define Donald Trump as a good father. And the reason they did it in this case is they want to show that he's a good person when it comes to how he treats women and that he has decent values. And so the kids are the outcome and you use the outcome to then define the process, which is why at the Republican convention, I can pretty much guarantee you, you're going to be hearing not just about Donald Trump, the world class businessman, but also Donald Trump, the world's greatest dad, which is funny because even Donald Trump says he had nothing to do with rearing his own children. But because of the system one approach to Donald Trump, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Even though Donald Trump tells you I had nothing to do with raising them, he, they're still going to do this and people will still accept it. So on the flip side, the Clinton campaign does a very similar thing, but they, they do it with a twist. She would grow up to be one of the most recognizable women in the world, but less well known are the causes that have been at the center of her life. After law school, she could have gone to a big law firm. Instead, she went to work for the Children's Defense Fund, helping get disabled kids out of the shadows and into their local schools. When she got to Arkansas, she brought reform to some of the poorest schools in the nation. Then as first lady, worked with Republicans and Democrats to win health care that today is covering eight million kids. And as secretary of state, she stood up for American values around the world, working to end the trafficking of women and girls. Through the years, there have been challenges, setbacks, but for Hillary, one thing's never changed. Helping children has been a cause of her life, and it always will be. I'm Hillary Clinton, and I approve this message. So the, the primary started, as Anita said, ages ago with a biographical ad about Hillary Clinton's mother and about how tough her upbringing was and how she was inspired to help women and children because of her mom's experience and how she became an advocate for women and children rather than going to a high-powered law firm in the beginning. As Anita was just reminding me is that the Obama had a biographical element in his 2008 story that was very similar um, about becoming an advocate. In that, in that case, it wasn't women and children. It was community, the community organizer rather than going to a Wall Street firm. So it's a very similar thing about the choices you make. So why would you go back like that? Well, you're trying to tell people about your basic values. In the case of Hillary Clinton, it's starting with the thing that people know is true about her, which is the daughter is a good person, so that she must have been a good mom. But in Hillary Clinton's case, they're using the story in a different way, which is she actually did pursue a lifetime advocate, a role as a lifetime advocate for women and children after it, and she will continue to do it as president. So what they're trying to do is to take that kernel and turn it into an agenda. So you can say, yeah, they're going to call me a liar, but the reality is this is something that you know is real about me. It's been my whole life, and this is how you're going to benefit from it if I become president. So that's why both campaigns ended up talking about their kids for very different ways. But in 
for communications theory purposes, a very similar reason. So the last thing, in this one, you, I kinda, you can do endless examples. Um, and these aren't the only ones, but these are the only ones I wanted to do for this. So there's a thing called a heuristic. Heuristic is basically a communications shortcut. It's a simple thing that lets you draw larger conclusions. So you have all kinds of heuristics. Um, so I wrote, I was just noting myself some heuristics I've come across in different campaigns. Is the candidate wearing jeans? Is the candidate wearing a suit, right? The fact that I decided to wear a tie is a visual, visual heuristic that I did on purpose in order to say, taking this seriously, right? As opposed to Stan, who really does not take this. <laughs> right, but we do these things on purpose, right? It's, <laughs> exactly. So it's a visual, but you know, but we've done like ads where the candidate is wearing jeans. I, so one super brief example, did a race for governor, the candidate didn't add, there was a lot going on in the ad, but the leading political reporter in the state's rea first reaction was, I can't believe she's wearing jeans, I bet she doesn't even own those jeans. These kinds of things are important. That's even the leading political reporter. We did one whole campaign for US Senate where we found that our candidate had a jeans jacket which made him look very informal. Prior to this, he was always wearing suits because he was head of the legislature in his state. We had the jean jacket in almost every ad because it connected with our larger message about addressing the concerns of working people. Those are visual heuristics. From Stan's experience, the fact that uh, just reading recently, uh, Paul Begala was talking about the decision to wear sunglasses when uh, Bill Clinton went on the Arsenio Hall show. The sunglasses, in addition to the whole thing being a heuristic, the sunglasses in particular were a powerful visual heuristic. Um, one of my candidates is someone who uh, had to explain why he opposes the death penalty during a campaign. We realized that once people realized that he was a Christian who had te taught carpentry, that gave people a heuristic, which was that he's a person who has very conservative personal values rather than very liberal personal values. Different kind of heuristic. Um, another one, which is a truism in American politics, if someone brings Hitler up in a campaign, that is a heuristic that you've gone over the top and you've been so negative that you've disqualified yourself? Hitler? Who, who, who got away with it? No, see, because there are a lot of examples. Well, that'd be, yeah, well, that'd be interesting. Right. Um, uh, Boris Johnson's hair, visual heuristic, right? He intentionally does that. I mean, presumably he knows what a comb is. But he does that intentionally because he's trying to send a message about how he's a different kind of person. So if you look at the, uh, some of the heuristics with these campaigns, I think, again, the Trump campaign has a pretty strong heuristic here. So he's trying to project strength, and then he's got his message. So he goes in front of large audiences where he's projecting strength, and he wears his hat, make America great again. So it's a visual heuristic, both the crowd and then, of course, the hat is a literal one. In the case of the Clinton campaign, they don't really have one that's like that, not in terms of manner of dress. They're not sending a specific message that connects with a specific voter group through that. Not with the setting either. The setting has been changing. So in this case, they're trying to drive a message about unity. So they were doing roundtables. She's meeting with a lot of people, and it shows she's sitting with other people. So it's a visual heuristic. Um, so not to leave people you know, just worried about Donald Trump and not feeling like there's anything you can do about it, um, there are a lot of things you can do about it. So one is you can also have an emotional appeal. And rather than thinking about your five-point plan, if you're dealing with this kind of strong argument, you can have a counter-emotion. And you need to think about if they're, what emotion are they projecting and offering? What emotion are we projecting and offering? Another thing you can do is you can offer strong third-party val validators because if you're in system one thinking, then, the credit, then what other people have to say about the candidate becomes a lot more important. What, and what happens here is, rather than thinking about my argument, let's say, if I'm doing system one thinking, you'll think about, do other people like my argument? Or do other people think that the argument is any good? So in Trump's case, a big negative for him is the fact that he doesn't have a lot of people who are willing to say, Trump's okay. He has the opposite. And that is a problem for him, given the kind of message he's running. Heuristics we talked about, simple proposals as opposed to complicated proposals. I think this, this year it's vitally important. The, the nature of proposals is really dumbed down because of it. But the other really big one is if people are getting driven into this mindset where they're really worried and they're really anxious, that one way to address it too is to try and calm people. If the basic problem is that people are worried about their security and they're worried about their economic future, you can try and match it. You can try and have an alternative version that addresses the worry 
and it sort of keeps them worried. Uh, for instance, going after rich people and going after the banking system and so forth. There's some of that. But I also think there's an alternative, which is if you can calm people, the calmer they are, the, diff the more they're, the way they receive messages will change, which is kind of my major conclusion as far as this goes. Um, so why don't I end it with that? I think I've probably gone on longer than I should have and then turn on to Stan Greenberg. Thank you.